from the UK, broadcasting around the world. Around the world. You're listening to the Mike Drop Club, hosted by Douglas Hamandiche. Message received. Message received. You do not need to know what you need. What you need. Just engage with the podcast feed. Just engage with the podcast feed. Providing weekly insights into cool stuff we've read, saw, did, or heard about what made us say, wow, eureka, damn, nothing is off limits. If it motivates and inspires you to reach your goals, then it shall be discussed. Featuring guest interviews from high performers and people of influence and weekly awards for the best mic drop moment. This podcast is guaranteed to leave you pumped up for the week ahead. Don't just live life, make life boom. He had a spot to where we start because I'll edit the show anyway, yeah? So it's not... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, hi everybody, it's Doug Sam DJ for another episode of the Mic Drop Club. Today, I am really, really stoked and pumped up. I have Dan Buckley in the house. This is a conversation I've been trying to tee up for you guys for a long, long time. You know, marketing is king right about now. You need to be able to market yourself. So I cannot think of somebody better with a wealth of expertise in this domain. Dan Buckley is the Managing Director of Ocean View Marketing. And that's just one of the gigs he's done. He's working across health and the private sector as well, but he does a lot of consultancy with other companies, helping them leverage and understand how to position themselves for whatever audience that they're in. So with no further ado, I want to bring Dan to the mic. Dan, how are you doing? Thank you very much, mate. I'm going to take that clip and I'm going to play it before any pitch that I go into, any new meeting with a potential client. I'm going to say, just hold on two seconds. I want to play something for you because you've summed up much better than I ever could do. Yeah, doing very, very well. Thank you. How are you? Me, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I am really pumped for this conversation. You know, there's, there's questions I have for you as well. Um, and this is, this is the conversation I have, particularly around um, personal branding. How can we get people to really understand what can marketing do for your brand, products, or services? So. There's, I think it's going to be a lot of back and forth um, t- storytelling. So what's your backdrop? How did you get into this um, game? Yeah, so I, I studied marketing 10 plus years ago at university. Came out of that. I was actually come from a sports background. So um, my first gig was in tech. I was working for an SAP owned company. I was one tiny little cog in a massive machine. Moved out of that to become a marketing manager at Oxford United Football Club, which is my hometown club. Um, My dream was always to work in sport. And then I got an invite down to Bournemouth to interview for AFC Bournemouth, who were in the Premier League at the time. Um, And they didn't have a marketing infrastructure. So I was 24 years old, moved to a brand new town I'd never been to. And my job was build this Premier League football club and marketing department. So I spent nearly four years there. Um, We had a small department, myself, an assistant, a data manager. But we built up the infrastructure from from pretty much nothing, which is remarkable, really, that you think that a football club that size would be in that position. But now it's a completely different beast. Um, So, yeah, that, that was my upbringing in a really fast and furious environment. Football is ruthless and brutal. And it set me up really nicely for consultancy because the speed in which I'm used to working um, was so fast that actually when I went into private sector and later into health, everything's been quite relaxed by, uh, um, by comparison. So fast forward to the pandemic and a lot of friends and family of mine that have small businesses were struggling to cope. Um, and I was saving for a wedding at the time. So I was like, perfect. I'll do some moonlighting and actually just fell in love with consulting and found the, the kind of it found it a lot more rewarding. Um, realized there was a business there, and in December, so it's funny enough, we're recording this now. In two weeks' time, it will be my three year anniversary of when I went solo and full time with Ocean View. Three years later, here we are. You wow. and I met a couple of years wow. ago, so it's a really important couple of weeks, this, um, which is nice to celebrate. And I think this is almost my celebration piece. Okay, guys, everybody ready? Absolutely, so I've got to give you a mic drop for that. 
you know, big up for that. Three years is no mean feat, you know, so well done. You were talking about um the, the football industry and how fast paced it is, because sometimes we can get ourselves in a rut when it comes to marketing. But I guess no bigger pressure can I imagine than a club that may be 100 years old that really has a, a fan base that still needs to market it itself to increase and grow that that following. So th- what sort of um, lessons learned can we take from that, for example, and bring it into, um, say, the health tech industry? I think one of the things that I bring over is that when you've got, when you're working within football, you're working with a vested audience. Your audience has a passion for the club and, and they care deeply. When we look at healthcare, how that translates, actually, if we talk about the end users, the end users of all of our products that we're selling into, into healthcare, they care about the results. The clinicians care. The hospitals care. So you're, one of the things that I found that's translated quite nicely is that you're speaking to an audience that has an interest and has an emotional attachment to, um, to the end product, if you like. Um, also, a, a big part of it is learning how to speak to different audiences. There are nuances. With football, you're speaking to fans, but you're speaking to corporates. You're speaking to hospitality purchases. You're speaking to community projects. You're talking to players. You're working with all these different um, audiences within the sport. Healthcare is no different. You don't just help market healthcare one single way. How I talk to a private clinic versus an NHS trust is very, very different. So managing those different relationships, those different target audiences, that's something that, that definitely crossed over, I think. Oh, wow. That, that's amazing. That's amazing. The way you've broken down the various stakeholders. And all too often when I'm doing work with um, software companies, we, we, we tend to stop like three different types of groupings from senior execs, you know, the frontline staff, and then you might say patient groups, whatever. But either way, you're able to quite clearly understand that there's so many different types of messages that need to go out. So how do you go about, say, curating a, say, a unified uh, message in terms of, say, a football club or individual so that people understand and just get it? Is there a, a, a silver thread that runs across the whole board or throughout the piece? It's It's more, for me, it's more like pillars. Um, so there will be overarching messaging, which is normally based, and I always start when I work with a new client on core values. Right, first thing we need to understand is your core values as a business and what you stand for, because no matter which audience you speak to, that's what's going to resonate. Now, I learned that at the football club. That's a project we did at the football club to understand what everyone thought we were and did it match with what we think we are. Um, and most of the time, it doesn't. Like you find that your idea of what your business is versus the reality is very different. So we start the core messaging based around values. And then the pillars come from understanding the audiences. Now, from a consultancy point of view, and I'm sure you found this from, from working, I don't, I don't, it takes me time to learn the business's audience. So this is where the client becomes really important because they know who they want to speak to. They know who they should be. My job is to take a step back and say, can I show you a wider picture of people you're missing? So then we base it on pillars. So we go, okay, our overall narrative, our strategic narrative, um, if you want to get technical, is um, is X. And it includes these values and these key messages on, um, for me, it's, I always describe, like, I do elevator pitches. One of the first things I do with clients is we go, what's your, what's your elevator pitch? And most of the time, it's like, we're a fantastic tech company that has all these features and features, features, features. And I always okay, well, let's just change it. What if I said structure like this? You know, Douglas, you know pro- you know, problem X, and I'll just say problem X as an example. No problem X. Well, what we do is we solve X by doing Y. And the evidence that I've got for this is a case study we did with Z that I'll be happy to show you if you want to see it. That structure I found in healthcare has really helped cut through a lot of, um, a lot of the noise because everyone is so feature-rich. Um, feature that saying that you've got lots of features is nothing. We want to get down to the core problem. And I think this is what we're going to talk about in terms of digital transformation. But how do we break through and actually talk about the problems? And um, yeah, I know it's a long way, long-winded way of answering your original question, but I structure that in, in pillars. I have to understand the values, the narrative, the audience, and it gives me these pillars that I can then just 
follow. No, no, excellent, excellent. Um, so I know we're going a bit off script, and I and I kind of like going off the beaten track once in a while. Um, in terms of when you work with an organisation or an individual, in fact, if, if they're large enough um, to peak your radar, when they they structure their values, yeah, they they've got their core belief system, their principles, all these things, you know, got the, every trust has a set of values and principles. What happens when you come in as a consultant? And you know through your own research or through the interviews that you'd be conducting with the um with the cut with the stakeholders, right? That they don't abide or they don't stick to those values. So it's always a really difficult conversation. The, the thing is, is I'm getting yeah. I'm getting paid to tell you the truth. Like that's the way I look at it. Like my job is to help you achieve the goals you want to achieve. My first way of doing this, and this is built off my experience when I was in football with third party agencies is I want to prove you right. That's my my number one objective. I want to prove you right. So if you think that those are your values, I want to prove that that is the case. If you're not, then I need to show you that you're not. But first of all, in a way that is constructive, not, not that I'm bashing it. Like that's the key. That's the key thing. It's the delivery. And I found that by going into it with that kind of attitude of like, you know your business, I'm here to make sure that you're proven right. And if you're not, then I'm going to tell you and we're going to work out how do we get you to where you want to be. But it's a collaboration. There's never there's never a problem without a solution in my eyes. And this is where marketing, I think, is as much science as it is art form. Like a lot of people get stuck in the creative. I know some wonderful creatives. And I, I like to think that I'm, I'm reasonably creative. I, I'm a good marketer, but I think I'm a better problem solver. And that comes from like the science side of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. And it's so refreshing hearing you speak, Dan. And, and like we said, it's just two years in the making. So you have to forgive me if I'm so geared up for this and I'm just going in. And I think it's important. We just have to hit our viewers, right, um, with enough mic drop moments and lessons learned that they can take away and do something with. Yeah, so what where, where we're aiming to fly this content is just outside the bones and inside the flesh. That's where we're going to be. And so, as you said, we are going to be touching nerves. We are, we are going to be going there in terms of, um, you know, if a company doesn't abide by its values, principles, you're willing and you're able to have those difficult conversations, which is so, so important because sometimes we go, a company can lose its direction and we can see it played out in the narratives, in the press more than what a CEO would tell you about their company. And in football as well, say a football has a, has a, has a family oriented value structure, but there's no family facilities in the whole grounds. This is a contradiction there. And uh, yeah, yeah. So you started the, um, you enacted on putting out a rant on LinkedIn. So it must big up LinkedIn for um, facilitating. <laughs> This conversation, as we see it right now, but you are coming from now the um, perspective as an expert health consumer, as we all are since COVID has affected us all. We're all now expert health consumers. So, just talk talk us through your experience with health services and how we kind of like shaping what you're doing now. um, Yeah, of course, it's it's. It's interesting because I, if anyone follows me on LinkedIn, I'm not super active, which is weird because I spend my entire life telling companies to be more active online and then I just don't do it myself. But I'm not naturally, like, I'm not that way inclined. Like, I watch, I watch, I go on there to watch and consume content. And that's how, obviously, after we met, when we first met, I already knew who you were because I followed you on LinkedIn and then we meet at an event and it's wonderful. And, and I need to do more. I know that. But um, so my situation, I, I'm currently, in and out of um, seeing doctors and GPs in the hospital. Um, thank, thank God, nothing um, overly serious. But it's been three months of having an issue, and it's an issue that I'm having with my stomach, and I'm not getting any answers. What I found difficult now, having worked in healthcare for a number of years, is that I spend every day talking to innovators who are trying to change the pathways and the processes within both the NHS and private. Um, to make healthcare better. And my first experience of being back in that system since working in healthcare, 
I'm seeing so many holes. And my rant on LinkedIn was around the barriers that, that are in place stopping transformation, digital transformation. So here's a breakdown of the story so far. I start feeling unwell in August, gets really bad, booking to see a GP. Can't see a GP, so it takes a few weeks to see a GP. Go in and see the GP, books me in for a blood test. Between that time, my case notes get lost. So when I arrive in my blood test, the nurse doesn't know who I am or what I'm needing. Now, one of my clients is an EPR provider, patient source. They make they do clinical noting as a module within their EPR. So you'd never have to have paper, yet my paper gets lost. So I'm frustrated at that. During that process, the doctor has to ring me, the GP has to ring me on his personal phone because their phone systems are down and aren't working and they're having a massive... I've got a telecoms provider 20 miles down the road as a client who does first-class phone systems that would eradicate this issue within the surgery. They'd be able to organize their phone calls. I give the guy my details to ring me and say, tell someone um, in management to give me a call. Doesn't happen, obviously. So the phones, I'm not getting phone calls back. No one rings me up about my blood test results. That's fine. A week goes by, I chase. Okay, yeah, we've got your results. Everything's fine. Uh, You can't see the doctor again for another three weeks. So at this point, it's end of of September, October time. So I go, okay, do you know what? I'm going to go private. I'm very lucky to be able to do so. Get a referral, go private. Insurance won't cover something. There's issues in there. So I'm having that going on. I see the specialist. Specialist charges £200. 15 minutes of his time which is fine at the end of it he gives me a prescription and uh, books me in for an old well doesn't book me in for an ultrasound i book myself in for an ultrasound where i have to go to the other side of the hospital to do that rather than say using a patient portal that a sister that an epr system could have to book everything online i then get my um i think i then get my um prescription uh the gentleman forgets to date my prescription so when i go to the pharmacy i can't get my medicine so at this point, I'm thinking, well, I know providers uh, that do um, e-referrals for pharmacies. Why am I having to take a paper record that hasn't been signed into the pharmacy? Then I go to the ultrasound that I've booked in. I come out of that. No one knows what prescription I'm supposed to have. So it takes another hour to get any uh, medication. So this whole time I'm going through this process and I'm thinking to myself, I know so many innovators in our, in our space in health that could eradicate all of these problems. It just got me concerned, not just about how is the health system going to manage the ongoing backlog, but what's going to happen and something I want to touch on shortly. I'm going to stop in a minute because I've been ranting, but um, is what about a generation of people who are having this experience whose relationship with healthcare is going to become unhealthy, who might be inclined to go next time that my stomach feels this way, I'm not going to bother going to the GP because I'm three months into this process. I've not had a diagnosis yet. And I'm booked in for another for another procedure before Christmas. I haven't been given that date as of yet. And I called the hospital this morning. So this is my my concern is what's happening to the end user and what's are we going to have a gener- generation of people who have an unhealthy relationship with healthcare because we're not putting the patient first? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow, there's a, so much to unpack there. And I obviously, I wish you a, a speedy recovery. And I, and I mean that sincerely. It's not easy. I'm looking for solutions. Um, you know, as we were teeing up this conversation, I was, I was starting to think about some of these barriers that we have that inherent within the health care system or panacea, as they say. Um, first and foremost, I want to wrap everything around and first big up patient source. I have to big them up. Um, is visibility of care is first and foremost a patient safety concern. If you if you look at the um, the healthcare services, healthcare service NHS or trust by trust, because everyone thinks there's one in NHS, but there are lots of trusts. And you were you were to pick a car to to um, sig- or to denote the 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 service that you work, that you're you're talking to, which car would it be? You know, would it be a Volvo that you'd be happy that, you know, if you've got your family in there, you cross, cross zones, zones all over the place, you know, ABS, all of that. Will it be a Porsche, a Ferrari constantly breaking down? You know, if you can uh, assign you know a car to match, what car would it be? 
firstly, before I say this, I'm going to just want to go on record and say I love the NHS. I have the utmost respect for the NHS. I think it's one of the one one of the best things about living in this country is that we have access to it and it desperately needs help. So I'm saying that first before I say this. I think part of the problem is that there is a denial about which car the NHS is. I think the – I'm never going to get to work with these car brands now. Um, I think the <laughs> NHS is an Alfa Romeo that thinks it's still a Ferrari, if I'm being honest. I think, okay. It, okay. Yep. I think it has all of the potential reputation, especially internationally. The, the, everyone wants to work with the NHS. But I think through – neglect through budget cuts through years and i think this is a problem with institutions in general we could probably get into a wider conversation about the branding around major institutions but i think it slips to a point where it is unreliable it tries hard but you don't know what you're going to get i think that's part of my problem um so i'll give you two more examples friends of mine and their experiences i've got one friend who had been feeling unwell, fatigued, chronically, um, was went on holiday, got a phone call two days in. Someone had made a mistake in the NHS and read to him a false diagnosis. So his GP rang him up and told him that he was HIV positive when he had misread something on mm. the track. On the thing. My friend wasn't, but on the second day of his holiday was told that when he gets back, he needs to come in because they, they, because he's got HIV and that isn't true. So it's just a failing of communication and of the system just getting it wrong. Another friend of mine having chronic issues with mental health, um, panic attacks a lot. The hospital or the GP don't believe that he's sick because they can't pick up anything on their standard tests, but there's nothing in place to help mm. monitor or assess his mental health. So he's going into the doctor saying, look, I'm, I'm having these panic attacks. I can't breathe. I'm having all of these physical symptoms due to my mental health. And they're going, we just can't see anything because it doesn't exist on our, on the tests that we're using. So this is what I mean. And like, you don't know what your experience is going to be. That's frightening. And that's frightening for someone like myself. If I had a family, I've, um, I'd be worried about, the kind of service they're going to get. And it has me questioning when my blood tests come back and say, it's nothing serious. I don't have a hundred percent faith. And we should in this country have a hundred percent faith that what we're hearing is what we're, is what is true. I think. Wow. Um, yeah, no, I don't, I'm totally with you on that one. Very quickly. I will say first and foremost, that um, <clears throat> when you have a health service that's geared around sick care, you have a problem. Because there's no, it doesn't manage wellness well. It doesn't, it hasn't got the inherent capabilities of monitoring somebody, you know, in their day-to-day life. So that's where we are. And there's a sick-based care model that we're still having to today, even though we have a lot of technology and the peripheries that can add a lot of value. We know without, if, I, I would really try to have this conversation without using the word interoperability. But if we look at any other, service industry, yeah, from manufacturing, engineering, um, retail, aviation, you know, um, banking, you know, pick one, you know. So do you um, think that's part of the problem that systems- you've, got a, you've got a reactive healthcare system, but you've got businesses in, yeah. and um, a new tech coming out that is focusing on proactive healthcare, but, it's, does it, but it doesn't match up with the standard behavior of our healthcare system do you think that's part of why we're getting these barriers yeah i, I could i could talk to that from a, from a clinical perspective i've worked for um trust where um the big focus with the new epr system is to get people out in the community right so you could triage them well you've got the patient flow dashboards all of that kind of stuff fantastic you could track their progress get get the person um, to a state where you can move them back into the community. The problem lies in, in the community, there are no services or there's a lack of services, you see? So, so, so we're pushing the problem upstream or downstream, which, whichever is your perspective in this. We don't, we don't have a, pro, a solution that talks to the whole system as a system. Um, also in terms of training, as a nurse, I was trained with nurses. I'm not, I wasn't trained with social workers. 
I was in trade with people that work in social prescribing as such. You know, um, all our training is un- unionized, compartmentalized, and we have different metrics to and different laws that govern us in terms of what we're going, to, what we have to do. That's not helpful. We need to be working together as as one team to help people um, live the best lives that they have. Um, you, you talked about communication. Communication is key, but again. If you're speaking French, I'm speaking English, it's going to be miscommunication. Um, I'm from the view as a technologist first, as a passionate technologist that grew up on tomorrow's world and at the ZX Spectrum, all of those things, right? I want to push the boundaries f- further and to even ask the question, have, have we reached the tipping point with our traditional health service in terms of if it cannot be enabled to do the things it needs to do to care for the population as it is now, not as it was before. For example, Dan, you are you are mobile, you're conscientious, yeah? I would like to say that you are not a, um, what we call in nursing, the ideal patient. The ideal patient is somebody that says, sit down, Dan, you sit down. Stand up, Dan. You know, you're not looking for um, that from the health service. You're not looking for the matron. You're looking for tools to enable you to live the life independently so self-management is what's important for you equally we have generations that are still looking for the matron that want that hand holding throughout the whole care process you know we've got young people coming in with a tremendous amount of skills and knowledge in terms of it and they as you i I think i think as you alluded to they then hit the nhs and thinking why can't I just book my appointment the same way I can book my flight? Why can't I just, yeah. why is it so disjointed that way? And they're losing faith, as you said. Um, the problem with if one's faith is lost, and using marketing analogy, is there's a cost assigned to um, every customer acquisition that you have for marketing, right? Yeah. And I think trust have to start thinking with that mindset. You know, when a customer... Um, receives poor care, incorrect information, the damage it does to that reputation of the organization is huge. Equally so, if they end up needing care, the costs are going to be increased because obviously you haven't caught the illness in time. The chances of recovery are then diminishing every day. The person not receiving care. And patient satisfaction goes down the hill, not only for the patient, but also the staff that have to give the care because they'll be saying, why didn't you come in sooner and get screened? You know, because always, it's always an innocent yeah. person, innocent nurse, innocent yeah, who's actually general, why didn't you come sooner for your scan? You see, then the whole history has to be played out over and over and over again. It's an easy conversation with private, I find. When I do campaigns for private health, the, mm. the money side of stuff resonates a bit better um because they kind of do they they get obviously they're making money per patient and it's more obvious i think with the nhs you kind of forget that that, that there is a cost per acquisition if you like uh with with private it's it's a lot it's a lot easier and and you can do that you can do that we we do that with again i use a patient source example but one of their clients um saves the money they save on just eliminating paper, just eliminating paper. The cost of the paper pays for the entire EPR solution. That's how much paper they yeah. use. Yeah. So when you can break it down to numbers like that, it's really impactful. And then you get one of the key decision makers because another challenge we have in healthcare with uh, marketing is there is seven, eight decision makers sometimes involved in these processes. So we need to market the businesses to be able to talk to the finance team and talk to ops and talk to the clinical team and talk to whoever else, the trustees, you have to, you have to be able to adapt your message to suit. And to do that, you have to say things like you have to bring the numbers into the conversation with the finance, the finance people. You have to be able to look at efficiency with ops and go, how much time are we saving you? How few mistakes are you going to make? What's interesting I found over the last few years is you don't tend to use the patient as much as I thought I would when I started marketing in health, because inevitably the patient benefits, but the decisions don't seem to come based on the patient experience. And that worries me a lot. 
from my experience is mm. I feel like the decision makers in the trust don't necessarily, and again, this is a mass generalization. So I'm not for one second saying that they're all at this, but just purely from the last few years, my experience is we don't position the patient as much as we'd like to, because that doesn't sway the decision making as much as, as I think it should, which can, which is concerning, I think as an end user. No, no, I, I think so. Um, if you use the Henry Ford analogy, if you ask people what they wanted, they'll ask for faster horses. You know, there's something about um, uh, being a clinician um, working in health that we're supposed to know what we need to do to help somebody get better, you know? And the patient knows best it is something that I'm a firm believer of. It's just they don't understand how to run a hospital. They understand their own care. Well, until we get to a state where where it's collaborative experience based upon mutu- mutually recognizing the expertise of a patient through lived experience and the expertise based upon academia from all the ner- healthcare professionals, and smash that together, you can you can start and then introduce new care models. At the moment, we don't have we have in, in saying and ge- um, gesturizing new care models, but to really transform care will mean turning health on its side. And I, I was challenged to change the whole notion. Let's just start with not having, let's start with no health service. What would we do? You know, let's yeah, start from that premise. There's no, there's no, there's no physical hospital in the area. What then would we need to do to keep people healthy? You know, and that to me is such a, such an exciting proposition because you start thinking of maybe prevention as the default standard yeah. way of giving care, uh, gamification to incentivize people to live healthier lives. You start doing some so, so much more fantastic joined up services between education, you know, um, um, employment, At the moment, even these, virtual virtual wards joined. now. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut over you, but, but virtual wards now, the ability to be able to run a ward virtually without ever having to to go to so, to see someone in person. The um, I have another client, National Health Tech, wonderful business. They create pathways for um, for clinics and, and surgeries by removing the need for the patient to be on site. So if you take spirometry, for example, um, the, a patient would come in, They'd be identified as a GP that they need a test. They'd have to come back. They'd do the test. They'd come back again to get the results. They'd come back for a third time at least to be able to speak to the GP about what they're going to do next. Maybe maybe the test results weren't conclusive, so we do it again. What they do, National Health Tech, is they take that away and they go, once you identify that a patient needs to be on this pathway, we will send the hardware to their house. It syncs up to the cloud. We will analyze it using AI and our own clinicians to report on real-time results that will then get sent to the GP. They then can speak to the patient knowing everything that's happened without them having to come in. Um, they recently, uh, very, very recently, recently helped a, um, a trust get through a three-year backlog in three months, 1,200 patients mm. um, by implementing these pathways. The patient never had to go. Once yeah. the patient had been in once, they didn't have to go back in because everything was done to their doorstep. It saved beds in hospitals. Um, everything was stored in the cloud and analysed ahead of time. Um, that, to me, should be best practice. How do we get through the barriers that we know that we have so that something like that can get be given a chance to to show what it can do? Yeah. Correct. Um, the key word there I'll take from that is best practice, right? So how do we get best best practice? If you use you're this new tech startup, you've got this grand vision of revolutionizing the way care is done. How do you then demonstrate best practice when you don't have it, you don't have enough runway in terms of time um, in, in, in the world actually use people using this stuff? How then can you resist me talk about best practice when we have here in the UK, we've got the CQC that publish reports on best practice, you know, and you, yeah. you're you too small to fly under the radar. You, your pilot has, hasn't got enough numbers to really, but we know, and they use just so confident that you can add value in this space. Here's where we're having this, the, the, here's where the battle lines are being drawn. Because these battle lines are drawn as long, are drawn only on the premise that the NHS has to be there. 
the physical hospital has to be there. Once the physical hospital is not there, it's a different conversation. As you know, if you want to see your, uh, if you can afford it and you've got the opportunity to go private, you can get, you can be seen tomorrow. You can be seen right now. Yeah. You know, for two take or whatever, you can be seen. Access to care is there if you've got the money, if you've got the resources. But we're talking about free at the point of care. You know, we need to be thinking about turning things on its head, as you rightfully said, using technology, embracing it. But the barriers that are going to come in, I'll, I'll call it out straight away, is, say, the unions. If you take a look at, say, um, I'm digressing a little bit. If you take a little bit, if you take a look at what happens with the, the train drivers and they're going on strike because their their terms and conditions are changing, you know, we were brought in to drive the trains and blah, 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 keep passengers safe, blah, blah, you know, and there are trains now that are self-driving, you know, and so mm-hmm. managing that tra- transition, the train driver says, no, my contract says I do this. So what then if we, if we do that to health and say, look, I'm a nurse, I was trained to give care according to these guidelines. And then the, um, the NNC will say, actually, you're more now like a cheerleader. What we want you to do, Douglas, right, is don't dispense medication. Um, don't write care plans in the way you done it before. I want you to, use, your job now is just to signpost the patient to where they can receive, receive support that would enable them to live independently. I'm sure you'll find a lot of nurses up in arms saying, no, this is, um, I want to work yeah. as a nurse. I want to work as a doctor. So you've got people holding on to the way they work. This is a, this is a change issue where human, you, the human side of change is very, very frightening. You were trained a certain way, you know, and it's, just, it's almost like when we made the leap from paper to electronic. We had doctors, we had nurses in tears. Some left the profession. They thought, no, I can't. I'm not competent in this new emerging technology. So you had very skilled, very competent practitioners overnight being de-skilled by technology. Yeah. And that, that circle will happen. That cycle will happen again when we, when we bring about this newer technology now. You know, it's going to, it's, it yeah. will potentially revolution that will shake, shake things up. I mean, it happens. It's happening in my industry. I mean, the the AI revolution is going to change how marketing is done, and and the need for mm. copywriters potentially. And however, the way that I look at it, and this is what I say when I talk about healthcare in this respect, is that actually, is looking at how does it complement what's existing rather than replace. So adoption is a massive problem with health tech. Right, is getting adoption. How many hospitals? In fact, probably all of them have at some point invested in a solution that never got off the ground because it had issues with adoption. Now, with my clients, I treat that at source and we go, let's make sure before we even get to that point, we have an adoption plan that we can help the hospital implement so that they have some best practice to know how to get people involved. A lot of that is trying to create an environment where the progression is complementing the service and helping the staff rather than replacing and then you can create a more positive culture around the implementation of tech because it's not there to screw you over and get you get you out of your job it's there to make your job easier or free up time so that you can go and do other stuff i think a lot of the technology that is a no-brainer is eliminating the menial tasks that you don't want your nurses doing anyway or you shouldn't have nurses having to spend their time burying clinical notes across the hospital or junior doctors. I know junior doctors who spend time just taking case notes and putting them in another office. That's insane. Like that, that, so I think it's about reframing, right? And a lot of what marketing does and and ocean view marketing as an entity was born out of, I don't think I've told you this, but it was born out of when I was at the football club, if I needed time to get my head around a problem, I used to sit on the cliff tops in Bournemouth. I used just to watch. And I had this sensation where when I, the longer I sat there, the more I'd see. And all of a sudden, my vision would get wider and I'd start noticing the paddle borders over there and the family in the kayaks and the barbecue that was happening on the beach. Oh, there's a fishing boat on the... All this stuff would come into view. And it gave me a clarity to see that bigger picture. And that's what I think wow. we need to wow. do when we're marketing this technology is we need to look at how it affects the entire hospital as a bigger picture, not just how it 
eliminates one problem because if you go in there saying we're going to get rid of this problem, you ignore the other problem. Mic drop. You Thanks, definitely mate, got bro. to get your mic up for that. I, I salute you for that. Yeah, I'll keep on, keep keep rolling, keep rolling. <laughs> so, the, so that's how I feel with it. Is you've got this situation where if you focus in, and this ha- this happens a lot when you focus on features. If you focus on features within a within a piece of tech, then you end up just focusing on one problem, but you don't look at necessarily how it's going to displace other issues, and then that leads to adoption problems, yeah. and then then it's harder to get over the line. You have to be able to take a step back and think a little deeper and go, how do we um, how do we address everything before questions are even asked? Because if you go to a prospective client and say, um, or a hospital, whatever it is, and say, This is what this is the problem we want to solve, but we've already thought about this other problem, this other problem, this other problem, and how this is gonna fit in the you're much more likely to make people at ease. Because I think risk aversion is a massive barrier to why we can't get tech adopted people don't want to take the risk because work it fails again you know yeah 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 and, and yeah and i've been burnt and many of my colleagues have been burnt with arm failing tech but as a technologist like, there's always something in that lesson that we need to take forward we talked about yeah. complementary um um technology and i and i salute you on that one i was going to i was trying to come in off the buzz of the mic up for that one because <laughs> that is exactly what about uh, it's complementary so when we talk about um Salt and pepper. They, they, they have two different chemical profiles, but they complement a dish. Complement a dish. They're different, but they complement a dish. So technology is exactly like that. So when we look at that, we always break it down to complementary capabilities. So uh, uh, the patient might have the ability to go and walk to, to the medicine cupboard. The medication might, be, uh, might have the capability, if ingested, to help the um, patient or the service user or cost client calm down. So he's talking about where can we bring technology in that it plays a complementary role, not an overpowering role. Because if you take a look at One Bird Flew Over the Cooker's Nest, 1976 film, a lot of those practices in health tech, in health, te- in health um, trusts are still there to this very day, to this very day. Um, so this is quite clear that there's the human side of change and transformation that needs to be observed and, and also find out whose problem is it anyway. Because there's yeah. so much middle management in the NHS, right? That every person is taking care of their own and they cannot see the full panacea like you can in terms of the seeing it, um, think deeper, um, expand your vision. They can't see it because they're not responsible for the dinghy, for the canoeist. They're not responsible. They're responsible, and they're going to be graded on how they can get the patient from this ward out. And yeah. they're not concerned, even though it's a revolving door. What we need to do is get to a state whereby they should be concerned for your work in in expanding that vision first, and then put in policies, procedures to make sure that they are also accountable for um, services just outside the remit and maybe reduce some of the operational overheads that we have because I've never seen so much management until you reach NHS. Yeah, you know, some people it's, say I it's mean, it's the, biggest em- it's, it's the biggest employer in the country for a reason. Like, like it needs that. Um, and, and you know what, I've got, so I've got a hypothesis that I want to test with mm. you about, about this because I think a massive issue with the decision-making maybe around apathy because one of the things I notice when I go to hospitals and speak to people is that actually the problem is bad and they appreciate the problem is bad and they want to try, try they want to try and change it however they've got to a point where they're so apathetic towards it that the need just isn't there like it's been like this for ages it's just one of those things okay. Okay. an example I want to use right is so I think mm-hmm. it was um 98 or something the national audit office identifies that we need to move hospitals onto some sort of electronic patient record system so that data can seamlessly move. That's the goal, right? Then in the years following, Mm -hmm. the deadlines that that were set by the NHS and by government moved back and back, and they wanted everything by 2005. Then 2013 was the goal, 2015. Then there was a five-year plan um, where everything was going to be moved by 2020. That never happened. 23 comes. That's the next one. That happens. Obviously, we had the pandemic. That affects everything. Now they're talking about 25. I have a theory that when you set these deadlines, 
without properly thinking through the process, you end up giving very short deadlines. Because let's be honest, moving the entire NHS onto a paperless system is not a 10-year project. It's, must, it's going to take a lot longer than that. Yeah. If you have, and this is my hypothesis, right? You've got deadlines yeah. that are set quickly with not a lot of time to, to fulfill, which then creates a rush, which yeah. then creates mistakes and poor decisions. So people start, in that time, the NHS... Um, pumped money into four different organizations to look into a, uh, a wider solution and canned it in 2015 because the amount of money that was spent, it was acknowledged that actually it escalated past the point. So deadlines lead to poor execution and mistakes, which leads to the deadlines being put back. So now the deadlines are meaningless because deadlines get set by people, so many stations above you. That if you're working in senior management in a hospital, you're not affected by those. It's it's not really going to happen. Then you don't want to make those mistakes again. So you've already been burnt. You've got a deadline that no longer matters, and you don't really want to get back in the pool because last time it was an awful experience. So I wonder whether it creates a culture of apathy where you go, what is the point? What What is the point? They've got so much. The backlogs are bad. Staffing issues um inside work culture within hospitals and for, especially for doctors junior doctors having an issue we can't get enough doctors now training do people look at some of the issues we're trying to solve and go i'm i don't care anymore is it created by that that process i don't know what do you think wow wow, wow that's massive that's that's ma- that's massive I, I i would i would talk to it in using different analogies um in the times of of Caesar, there was a famous battle where where he, his soldiers had to cross the Rubicon, um, and that became known as like a stretch of river, and that became known as a point of no return. So, when you create deadlines that are meaningless, you don't have the point of no return. Then, so straight away, people think, okay, it's going to be spaghetti fight. It's going to give me another deadline, another deadline. It's meaningless. We can we can transform services overnight if we have a compelling reason to. A compelling reason to is the reason why we talk about virtual wars in the way we're talking about it now, in terms of virtual consultations, in terms of this app that we're using now, Riverside, comes out of COVID. Now we've got mm-hmm. a reason to connect. You, you see what I mean? There's, there has to be a compelling reason. And when politicians have no health understanding, that can be moved from post to post, different departments. Had it today. Someone's coming in out of the wilderness to come in and take it up a job that they've done for seven years. He who shall not be named. <laughs> shall, shall not be named. Right? But this yeah. is what they do. They don't, they don't know what they're talking about. So if you create a compelling reason to, people will change. Absolutely will change. They have to have the permission to fail as well. You know, a lot of people, they're, they're, they're defensive, they're, they're waiting for their pension. Um, and all of these factors are interplaying with one another. You know, there's a political landscape. Just before election, they were, they were, they were, the government at hand wanted to say something to win more votes. So this is how we're going to revolutionise the NHS. Here's how we're going to cut the waiting times. Here we're going to increase patient satisfaction, reduce patient safety, um, concerns, et cetera, et cetera. It happens every four years. They're going to come up a bit. And then we who are working within it, even from a technology perspective or a clinical perspective, have to try and make sense of this new um, directive that also comes with a new framework yeah. for the companies to bid and, and make sure they make, make it on the framework, which is another ball lake in itself. Just to get on the framework, just to be visible on the framework, is a lot of start, startups can't afford it can't afford to get a clinical safety officer in to just make sure that it, even though they've done their due diligence, they can't afford it, you know? So that, that so you've got that playing as well. At the same time, you're not going to get paid for maybe three to four years. So how are you going to keep the lights on from a tech, tech perspective? You know, technology is brutal. It's the most brutal, um, I would say, sport or, 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 or thing you could ever imagine because people don't care. There's no brand loyalty. You know, I could tell you, I remember having my ZX Spectrum 48K when I was about eight years old. I got a Commodore 64. I never played my Spectrum again. I never played it again, right? From a Commodore 64, I moved up to Atari ST 520. 
Never played with my Commodore 64 again. I got an Amiga. I got Amstrad CPC 464. You know, I think you can understand. I'm a geek. I'll do this for real. I'll yeah. Betamax to V8. You know, we don't go backwards. Mini disc to super, super um, high definition. All of these things. It's moving so, so fast. Yeah. I'll tell you what, I am. Um... Sorry. Go on. Yeah, I was just saying, the common denominator for all of this is the individual. And, that's, and it goes back to your central point. When we use slogans such as um, patient, put the patient first, patient-centric, all of these things, and then you come in and you say, hey, okay, fine, you say you're putting patient first, show me. Actually, show me. You know, a lot of these companies, a lot of these trusts, um, have it more in, in slogan form than in the actual delivery of that because it takes somebody to have um, the fortitude, yeah, the fortitude to stick their career on the line and say, do you know what, we're going for this. And technology has never been cheaper. It has never been more cheaper. The stuff that me and you can do in terms of tech, you know, for mm. peanuts, we can outsource stuff. And yet trusts are still paying £100 million for EPR system. Can you imagine that? Hundred million pounds yeah. for EPR system, you know. It's that's, insane. That's, that's already legacy. That's already old. It's insane. So there is money there. It's just again, it's the mechanisms that surrounding all of that kind of stuff. And if from if from a nurse's perspective, if I look up and I see the chief executive, or whatever trust I've been working for, making decisions that are are not correct, taking budget away for systems that I know that are, are not going to add value, that makes me have apathy. It makes me think, okay, mm. fine. I'm just going to ride it out until I get my pension. There's no point because I, I cannot leverage. I cannot um, put any levers to change what's coming anyway. That's the problem. Yeah. I, everything you said, I totally agree with. And the one thing, well, one of the many things that stands out is that permission to fail thing, I think is really important. It's really hard in, in our industry and in health because failure can be, can be deadly and and we can't afford to take risks it's so risky it's such a risk adverse environment and it needs to be to remain safe i um recently spoke to a company who had we were talking about evidence-based marketing so how do we one of the things you said is if you can't if you're a startup and you can't get in front of people how do you build up the evidence to then position yourself as a solution they really cleverly leveraged academia and student hospitals and invest a lot of their own money to be able to provide a service at an academic level, which then gave them the case studies and the clinical trials. Well, they'd already gone through clinical trials as part of the process, but it gave them the evidence to then position in front of hospitals and clinics. And I thought that really stuck with me. I thought it was a really clever idea. I'm not going to take any credit for it as if it was my own. I could have just pretended like I did that. But um, yeah, I think that's a, I think, Maybe leveraging academia is a good way if you're a startup to to build up that evidence because otherwise you're kind of just hoping someone's going to take a chance. And we've just kind of talked about the people that are making the decisions aren't the types of people that are going to take a chance on a SME when this is the same industry that goes and spends a hundred million quid on Epic or Cerner. Shout out Epic and Cerner. I've got, you, no, you no beef. I've got no beef with them, but. <laughs> 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 no, 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 it's good. It's good you called called it out because um, there's a word that is that's coming into our vernacular now more and more often with startups. We do a lot of work with startups, and that's pilot itis. You know, if you speak to typical trust, how many pilots are they running concurrently as it stands? But if you, you know, yeah. and these pilots go into the ether. And they get so boring with these things. And at the same time, the startup company, company is hemorrhaging. A three-month a three pilot can be spaghettified to nine months. And they might not get older for another year mm -hmm. or so, back and forth. No, this, this, is, this is a real, real issue that we have, pilot-itis. You know, um, why do you have to, like the big, the big companies, they're not piloting. When you get like Epic involved, no, every trust likes to say they're unique. That's why every trust has their own set of care plan structures, mm. their own progress note structures. Every trust tries to say they're unique. They've got own, own independent slogans. So big companies can come in with no pilot and you have to buy their product for 10 years. 
and they're not piloting. They're saying mm-hmm. these uh, these here use our stuff, right? And there's a, there's an element whereby any incumbent supplier um gets fat from the land, meaning they they lose the will to be creative and add innovation because they're just now pleasing their shareholders. You know, if you look yeah. at most of these companies, they've got a list as long as long as your I don't know as long as something very long a piece of string to probably three quarters of a mile yeah, of yeah. change requests. But they're, not, yeah. they're never going to ask them. And you know what, trust are powerless to, to force them to, to innovate. Look at all these EPRs. Most of them belong in the Stone Age, to be honest. They belong in the Stone Age. They're not fit for purpose. And this is why I'm saying that we need to have a light-touch NHS, right? Mm-hmm. A light-touch NHS. Because there's enough tools, if we, are, if we are digitally savvy, to enable us to live a quality, good quality of life without having to go to the NHS, right? Um, you asked about, um, you, asked, you, you talked about um, um, the pain points, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the pain points, and I, and I then start talking about the reason, compelling reason. The problem with the NHS is this. We are jams, and the, that's, a, that's a political uh, way of saying we're just about managing, yeah? We're jams. Mm-hmm. We're just nice. about managing. And most CEOs know we're just about managing. So when it was so when a trust or when, when a nurse or a doctor goes there complaining, they expect that to happen because we're just about managing. Yeah. What what will peak their radar is not you're not just about managing, you can't manage now. You see what I mean? You yeah. now no longer have a niggly pain in your in your mouth. It's just slight discomfort that you take with some neurofen. You've got a howling toothache to the point you can't balance, you can't see, you can't smell. Then you take action. And that's the problem. So all of these, you know, we, we tell, tell startup companies, define the problem and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Well, if the problem equals just about managing, that doesn't peak the radar for most trusts. Who are already cash strapped. Okay, guys, everybody. That's your mic drop. That's just a mic drop moment for you right now. I give you a mic drop moment because that is absolutely spot on. That's, yeah, you're 100. percent You are 100 percent right. And I know you know um, Andy Raskin's strategic narrative um, model. He talks about it in that. Like, what happens if we don't change? Like, what mm. happens if what happens if we stay the same and don't and don't evolve, don't transform? And what you're saying is absolutely spot on. You have to paint that picture for them. I use a lot of my clients. Um, we have to be able to say, if you don't do this, this is where you're headed. And then say, well, we've mm-hmm. got the tools to guide you away from that and send you to the promised land, which is something else. But you're right. If the answer to what happens if you don't change is we'll just about manage with your, without your solution, they'll never do it. They'll never do it. Do you find, because you work a lot with um, with founders and and uh, individuals on their personal brand at the start of their story. Do you find that founders for small businesses and startups quite often get caught up in problems that they perceived as massive in their context, which is why they led to build the solution, but don't find it very easy to take a step back and go, is this problem really a problem from for someone else? Do you see a lot of that? Yeah, I, I see a lot of that. And also there's another problem we have with a lot of startups. Um, whereby you get somebody comes with a creative idea and they're using their skill to build the brand, to build the company up. So you might be a coder. I said, you know what? I, I enjoy coding. So bloody hell, I'm, I'm going to use my skills as coding to do my one, one website, build an app, blah, 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 blah. And it's actually them doing the work. So whereas if, you, if I give the, um, a, 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 a bakery analogy, if you like to bake cakes, and you were taught to bake cakes from your, your parents, your grandma, or whatever it is. They taught you, and you love it. You, you bake cakes with a passion that's, that is second to none. Your cakes are the, the best. And then you're getting stressed at work all the time. You, you get, you get that tipping point. You go, hmm, why am I, why am I putting up with this crap? I can bake cakes and they're bloody well good. Then you go, logic says, oh, I'm hitting 30 now. I'm going to start my own business. I'm going to, I'm going to start a bakery. All of a sudden now, you now baking cakes have to then understand business, which yeah. is a completely different kettle of fish. You've got to understand now you're not baking for a few people. You're baking 
dozens upon dozens. You're cleaning, hygiene, you know what I mean? I'm selling all of these skills that you never thought of before. They're suddenly coming to you now, you know? And for some people, that leads them to burn out in their business very, very quickly because they, they didn't do or they didn't appreciate when they were a full-time employee that you got a boss that only does mm -hmm. managerial work. You saw me, you got a cleaner that only does cleaning work. You, but now when you are doing all of those things, as well as your coding, you know, you, you end up forgetting what the customer wants, you know? Yeah. You know, I'm customer, so glad you said that. Customer, yeah. <laughs> I'm so, I'm so glad you said that because this is exactly, uh, it's exactly my take. And uh, the, the um, example I always give is I know my time tables, but I can't file my taxes. I get an accountant. It's not the, so many founders that I work with try and do way too much rather than actually getting the right people in to do the jobs that are better. My entire business is based on the network around Ocean View. I'm, I'm not a graphic designer. I went and found fantastic graphic designers I work with. I'm not mm. an SEO specialist, so I work with an SEO specialist. If you need a website done, I can do some basic website stuff for you, but I've got a website person I can go to who's excellent at that. Why would I, trying to provide a service to you, try and give you less of a service rather than acknowledge what I can do and what I'm strong at? And for everything in between, mm. I'm going to get someone that's better than me to do that. They're going to come in and do it because. Yeah that's the least that you deserve. I think it was easy and it's, e it's easier in a service industry like mine where I'm not having to build or code anything. I think founders that are quite techy that build the code themselves, it's harder to let go because you're properly in it. Um, but I, I'm glad you've said what you've said because I totally agree. I think um, people get too close and don't realize all the other skills that go into making a business. You're not selling... I remember having a chat with with a friend of mine and and he said this to me. So you're not selling a um sorry, you're not building a company to create a great solution. You're building a company to sell the solution at the end of the day. And that's quite a cynical way of looking at it. But you have to be a company that's you have to yeah. build a company that's trying to sell that product, not just to create the best product ever. Because if you haven't got the sales in, you'll do it for twelve months, you'll go bust and then you're done. Exactly, because they're building the product. Mm. Building a product is no different to baking a cake, baking a pie, flipping a yeah. burger. Building a business selling burgers has nothing to do with how good you are at flipping a burger. Building a yeah. bakery has nothing to do with your individual ability to bake the best tiger loaf. Nobody cares. But as long as they know that you know a process to get somebody in to bake the, the, those bread, those loaves of bread, your, or flip those burgers. This is the business acronym. So, the, so a lot of founders. This, when I work with tech, tech, tech startups, I take them through a boot camp. Uh, I have, have exercises with them where I, I say, okay, what we're going to do now is we're going to do a org chart. Org chart. Let's do org chart, guys. You know, and then they, they start with themselves as CEO. Founding director. Well, every time I see a founder on LinkedIn, I, I, oh, I never use founder. I, know I never, I never use founder. It should say burnt out. It should just say burnt out, <laughs> right? So I say founder, stop burnt out, and you put your name. Then, then, then through exercise, we say, um, do the branches. Yeah, the, the genogram, all the positions you you should imagine in that needs to be fulfilled in your business within five years. You know, from sales director marketing to um, admin, um, delivery, all that. Put them down, like how you see a business in five years, right? And they can do that. Then I'll, then, then I'll take them for another exercise and say, look, write down all the jobs that you are actually doing right now yourself. Yeah, be brutal. And you'll find that most of those jobs, <laughs> they're doing yeah. as founders. They do them themselves. They are doing their own accountancy and they're fucking up. You know what I mean? They are doing their own sales and they can't sell. You know, because they're selling with their passion. Look, I built this code. You see what I mean? They are doing all of those things themselves. So I say, so the, the final part of the exercise is, okay, you've done all that now. What can you do to sack yourself? 
Your job is to sack yourself from each one of these positions until you've got none of these positions there. Because to be honest, all those positions you shouldn't be doing. You, sh- you need to be having a strategic view and build the business, going on lunches, networking. That's what you need to be doing. All these stuff are the people running your business. But how can you sack yourself from marketing? What do you need to do to market? How can you sack yourself from, from baking those cakes? Okay, you, you, your mom gave you the formula or your parent gave you a formula to bake these cakes. Map it out. Your job is to write down processes mm-hmm. so that anybody can do that thing for you. So if you're even going to use a Fiverr account, whatever it is, they've got a process locked down so they can deliver it for you. Then and only then you can sack yourself from that position. And your job is just to do quality control, maybe, until you're satisfied for every single position. And if, they, if you've got two people doing things, the same thing, each person in your team should be trying to sack themselves, should be actively trying to sack themselves. Mm. Then you're going to see now your business start to scale and grow. Business don't grow because people then get, get caught up in labels, you know, um, um, a director of sales, and they stay there and languish. Instead of thinking about, okay, if I was to leave my job as director of sales and I, and I could do something else, what would I need to do? Maybe split the team to two, get some regional guys that are accountable to this person and make sure it works. Here's the process, here's how I sell, do that. A lot of people are not thinking of business in that, in that, um, in that way. They're, they're, they're too close to, to, the, to the sun, really. They're, they're, they're blinded. By what they've built. And they think it's they think it's better than what it really is. And to be honest, it's not the best tech that wins in this game. As no. we're seeing with the likes of, you know, those that, that big giant that cannot be named, that should not be named, yeah. you know, it's not the best tech that wins. It's the best business. Yeah. That and that wins. that's do you know what I feel like. If when you're naming this episode, that needs to be somewhere in the in either the title or the um, description because yeah you're absolutely right it is the best business and this is the conversation to bring back to marketing a conversation I have to have with people is how much are you expected to spend on marketing well in best practice is 7-10% to of your revenue should be going on, on sales and marketing but you tell a startup that who have invested all of their money in R&D it's really difficult so one of the one of the, the roles I do is a lot I do a lot of workshopping so instead of going, okay, do you know what? You need a full marketing team to be able to start doing this. Well, let's start off with a couple of workshops. And let's go through all the stuff we've been talking about. Core values, strategic narrative, your target audience, your market positioning. Um, uh, quite often, I might bring in someone that is a sales guy. So I do, um, we were talking about it before. Um, I'm doing some work with the guys at Beta Healthcare there, consultancy that help go to market strategies for um, for healthcare companies. Um, they help scaling strategies to scale, full business package, wonderful guys. I might bring someone like that in to talk about the sales side and we might look at the sales cycle. Workshop it all out first. Get the right people in to give you an idea. Then you can then you can stand back and go back to that and you can have your marketing strategy and the, all of the foundations in place and go, right, what are we trying to build here? Because if you think as a founder you're building a skyscraper, but you've got the resources to build a bungalow, you're getting a bungalow. Like you're not. You have to. You have to be able to understand what resource you've got, what you can actually do for your investment, and then take it. And then take it from there. But not enough people start with marketing and sales. And it's easy for me to say it because mm-hmm. I'm a marketing guy, and I and marketing and sales are cousin to sister disciplines and we hate each other but we need each other it's symbiotic um i always rely i always relate it to um to guns and ammunition like one of my best friends mm. is a sales consultant has worked tech startups really impressive mm. guy um and we're always bantering each other about it and i say to him like it's all well and good you having these big guns but you'd be nothing without having any bullets and he was like well, what are your bullets or if you don't have any guns to fire them. And I always think that's the perfect way to describe sales and marketing. But you're not catching, you're not going and catching anything if you don't have sales and marketing as a priority. You'll just be no, another absolutely. tech company that fails, unfortunately. Yeah. 
And then the, good, the beautiful thing about sales is it can be learned. Sales can be learned. And I've been in this game now over 20 years and I've, I've supported more sales teams than I have implement, implementation teams. Can you imagine wow. that? And I don't have a sales background, but I recognize that sales is everything. You know, we, we sold each other. That's why we're having this conversation. We, we, would, we wouldn't have partners if we weren't into sales. We wouldn't have the career that we are in. Mm. So sales and marketing, and I use the same type of analogy. I just, just expand it and say, look, sales, is, sales are your foot, foot, foot soldiers. You know, marketing is your aerial cover. You know, before, before we put boots on the ground, you've got to have aerial bombardment. Sorry about it. It's the wrong time of year to talk about that, but it's just the truth. Yeah, well, no, I know what you mean. Aerial, yeah, yeah. You've got to have the aerial cover to, so that when you go down, when you do that cold calling, the groundwork is going to be laid out. There's always there's a point of reference that you're saying on that call. You know, it's, that only comes from aerial cover. It doesn't come from any other, any other source. And knowing how to do that is an art, is a skill, is a science. And I would say the books I read to enable me to do sales, marketing, and all the other creative elements they're moving more and more out of the realm of traditional marketing books. They're more to do with philosoph um, philosophical positioning. You know, how does the mind actually work? And, um, you know, how do you um, instill faith? How do you work out somebody's belief systems? All of these humanistic types of things. Because I think once you've got that underpinning and know how the human operates, when I go in there to support a sales team, you know, I'm having a human to human conversation with a CEO and a conversation can go something like this. You know, after you build up a relationship, you will know what fear that CEO is going through. And you might be talking directly to the fear and also giving them hope. I'll come in as like um, a support mechanism. And I'll be saying, if you do this, if you implement this technology, do you know, not only will you make history, not only will you be able to retire, having left some legacy there, you know, do you know that patient that you looked after last year on your books? That will never happen again. You have the personalized approach um, to all the clinical engagements that you have with the clinical staff as well. Because you start stripping away, as you talked about, the um, features. When we look at an Apple product, it, they have one line, one line to to express a feature, and when you we go to these health conferences, which I'm and I, and I'll say this as a, this is a clarion call to all health to all tech startups that go to Rewired, um, what was other ones, Convensus health events, yeah, um, hex, H, the whole... hex, that kind of stuff. Please, yeah. if you go to if you're going to go there to display your wares. Have something to announce. Mm. Have something that is new that you want to get behind. Because all I see is features. I walk past yeah. the features and slow. Them. I don't see anything new. And sooner or later, those outside of B2B conversations, they're starting to lose their their um their real value, you know? Yeah, for sure. My, my, my pet hate at these, I go to these events and um, I enjoy them, but I'm like a magpie. I go to events because I want to pick up what everyone else is doing. I have such a pet hate of seeing transforming digital health. Black X solution, changing health. Just like these generic statements just don't work. There's an art form to coming up with um, strap lines. Um, th there is a skill to it. It needs a lot of consideration. But I see the vaguest yeah. ones. Where I'm like, I don't remember. I don't remember what you do. You've not made an impact <laughs> at all. Told me anything about your business, but that may come from the fact you don't understand your business. And it's interesting the stuff you're saying about understanding the salespeople and the target audiences because I the psychology of marketing is what got me hooked. So I've said to people previously, if I was if I had the time and the willpower to do another degree, I would do a behavioral sciences degree. I'm fascinated with behavioral sciences. I read books on it. Um, I believe that we are, we think we're a lot more complicated as creatures than we actually are. And behavioral patterns for 
human beings can be predicted to a certain extent if you understand the context in which they're living. So I take that, put it into the marketing process and the strategy building and try and build a strategy around how people behave. Because if you can just understand and get into the heads of the people you want to talk to, that's how you have success mm-hmm. with marketing. So I'm obsessed. Oh, Behavioral yeah. studies is like is a massive passion of mine. So hearing you say that, that is a like, this is probably why we get on so well, to be honest. This is probably how this all started is because we're quite similar in that kind of intrigue. I want to get inside your head and go, oh, what is Douglas thinking? Like, well, how does how does he see the world? Because it, <laughs> it can affect how I see it, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, uh, no, absolutely. And we, we can have those conversations and share books. And, you know, because I think th- th- these are these are the angles. You know, in, in snooker, you rarely hit a cue ball against the ball foot straight on. It's the angles. It's the angles. Yeah, yeah. Because the more angles that you know, the the, the, the better you are at, at snooker. You know. Um. So I'm 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 from that position that we I give all my facets to every consult consultancy I do. So when I'm when I'm booked in to do transformation piece, they don't just get a, a transformational um expert. They get change management uh, expert. They get a a geek, they get, I, I, I present with all my heads, you know, and I think too often when you work with people on the ground, they tell you what their job is and they work within the constraints of the job and no more, no more. You, you see what I mean? And I think that is also blighting um, the NHS in the fact that people then are not able to embrace the second degree that they have. You know, they're not able to embrace the, the the passion they have for, say, baking. So when somebody's recovering from, say, a stroke, they say, oh, let me help you bake a cake. They're not doing those things. You see what I mean? They're stuck with the same old lift your leg up, lift your leg down. You know what I mean? They're not, they're not, come, they're not fully present um, yeah. in the conversation with the patient. And I think if we can bring technology to bear that enables um, clinicians, um, Educators, you know, um, teachers as well, you know, employers to liberate themselves from the shackles of just what a job is supposed to be and to do to do more. I think we will we'll, we'll, we'll turn a corner, we'll turn a massive corner because I speak to so many um, people that say, Doug, like, why do you do and how do you do what you do? You know, that's what they say. They say, yeah. who gave you permission? I say, who gave you permission? I said, nobody gave me permission. If I asked for permission, the answer would have been no, particularly when I was in the NHS. If I said, oh, I want to do some YouTubing, I would have to write a like, mini business case and meeting after meeting. Then by the time it comes out, be so sanitized, all mm, the yeah. passion would have been gone. You know, I think technology now is, is it could be such a, um, uh, it's so accessible. You don't need permission from anybody to do anything. And I think that should be the the fear that the NHS has, that their patient has choice. Their patient can choose to go elsewhere. And what happens when they go elsewhere? The relevance of that organization is slowly diminishing. You know, then they'll be like trying to corral the patient, come back to us, we can take better care of you, et cetera, et cetera, which is what we're seeing now. But I think... Um, to 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 a large degree, those who are able, who have mobility, are already making choices. They are choosing where they're going to receive their care. They are exercising those rights. It's just obviously the majority of people do not know how to ac- access some of these um services. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And it's nice to have a chat with someone who sees it from a similar point of view, has experienced some of the challenges in their own work, and. Um, and yeah, I, I, it's been it's been a pleasure kind of going through this with you and and having a bit of a rant. But hopefully, people will find it interesting. And it might just my my goal with any of these types of things, whether or not I do podcasts or I do talks, or I go to universities and do pieces, is just to try and get people thinking a bit differently about how to approach marketing and selling their business within our within our industry. I think that's all we can do through this type of content. So hopefully, people find it interesting. No, fantastic. And it, I'm conscious of your time as well. Is there anything right. you want to leave? 
How can people get access to you? Where can they find you and reach out and get access to the wealth of expertise that you have? LinkedIn is the best place. Just search for me on LinkedIn. You'll find me there. Um, you can email me, dan at oceanviewmarketing.co.uk is my best email address. Go website is just oceanviewmarketing.co.uk. There's information on there um, that you can use. And yeah, I, I offer these what I call marketing health checks. So it's an hour free consultancy where we sit down and just evaluate what does the start of this process look like for you? What have you currently got? It's completely free. I enjoy doing them because I get to meet some amazing people. I've done countless amounts of these now. And I always try and make sure that someone leaves with some insight. So if you want a health check on your business from a marketing point of view, reach out. More than happy to book you in and we can do that. Fantastic. Okay, guys, everybody ready? Thank Thank you very much. And we look forward to catching up on the other side. Take care. Yeah, thank you, mate. Cheers. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to check out micdropclub.com and get the show notes and useful links. Subscribe to the podcast. Don't just live life, make life boom.